Okay, I think we can start. Uh, I have only a couple of housekeeping announcements, uh, mostly for people who didn't make it to the last uh, sessions or um, and, and for students. Um, so we started finally to add the videos from the first um, from the first seminars, and you can either access them from the home page or you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, and there is a playlist for. Uh, this year, well, the, the, the talks for the two second and the third are still missing, but they are being uploaded these days. And here you will find all of them in case you missed any. Um, and particularly for students, uh, if this is helpful to give you an idea of the topic and related things, or, you know, related to the topic that you are selecting for your final poster, you can also have a look to the play at the playlist for the two past series. So there is the one for la last year and the uh, one before the last one. And you can skim through and maybe you will find something which is related to the topic you chose um, and maybe it was covered, um, was covered in the previous series. And then I just wanted to say uh, maybe once a week or something, just check uh, this page because I updated it uh, yeah, a couple of days ago with a couple of um, Heimweiser uh, about you know software and then there is also something about the language. Uh, the poster can be, well, it's fine in German, but can also be in English if you wanted to do it in English. And then we added a couple of suggestions for software and formats, very practical things, uh, and also how to structure a paper, um, a couple of PDFs uh, as examples. So from time to time, just make sure you check it. Um, apart from this, I think nothing else. So I'm really glad to introduce Dr. Bruckmans, uh, who received recently a PhD in archaeology at the University of Southampton and is now a postdoc at the, UN at the University of Constance. Um, and is presenting today about the Roman Bazaar, but I will just let you two. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Matteo. Matteo promised that he would give a couple of very embarrassing anecdotes in the, of me in the introduction, and he didn't do so. It's a shame. All right, then I'm just gonna jump in. My name is Tom, um, and I'm an archeologist, uh, but unlike my affiliation there, I suggest I'm not a computer scientist, I'm definitely an archeologist, but I'm based in computer science now as part of uh, an archeology span project. So I'm trying to become a bit of a mediator between computer scientists and archeologists. And I have the impression attending a lot of digital humanities events like this one, but also uh, the similar events in London, for example, that these kind of mediators are becoming ever more uh, common. I'm hoping there is a viable career path in there, but so if ever anyone else is in a similar situation, I'd love to talk to you guys. So that is um, um, an anecdote about my personal interests. Now, I'm just gonna jump in and give you the take home message of this talk straight away. And then you can decide whether you're gonna stay here for the next 30 minutes or just run away if it doesn't interest you. The take home message is this. I think that the study of the Roman economy has hit a wall. And this for three reasons. Firstly, there's a lot of interesting descriptive models but that are virtually uncomparable. Secondly, there, is, there are very few methods that allow us to formally compare these uh, models and they have been virtually unapplied in the study of the Roman economy. And then thirdly, the potential for archaeological data, for large archaeological data sets to validate hypotheses about the Roman economy remains underexplored, uh, right? Now I'll elaborate on those points a little bit more. So firstly, there's, when, when I look at the literature, well look, when I read the literature on the study of the Roman economy, I have the impression that there is a lot of very interesting models out there, a lot of models that aim to describe exactly how the Roman economy functioned, which individuals or corporations or groups of people were involved in it, how they were uh, communicating with each other, how they organized transport, how much it costs, everything about the, the functioning and the performance of the Roman economy. Yet very few of those actually use concepts that are the same concepts as those used by other models. Very few of them try to abstract this very complex past phenomenon that is the Roman economy in all its complexity into clearly defined concepts that are then commonly used by other models 
but also, for example, concepts the, uh, adopted for, from the study of uh, the modern economy. These kind of things are rather rare, right? Now, that is kind of a problem. It's not a problem for coming up with an interesting model, not at all, right? We constantly try to abstract a very complex past phenomena in, this, in, in terms of concepts that we think best describe that phenomenon. There's nothing, no, nothing problematic about that. But if you have multiple of those very complex descriptive models, then you need a kind of common ground to be able to compare them. Now, I find that is lacking. Uh, another thing that I find is lacking is that even if some of these descriptive models come up with very clear concepts and very clear definitions and they use the same concepts, then still too rarely do I notice these concepts being translated into data requirements. And with data requirements, I mean what kind of patterns in archaeological data sets or in literary sources or just generic hypothetical data points, what kind of patterns would we expect to see if our hypothesis were true? If my idea of how the Roman economy functioned is the right idea, what then would I expect, right? So data specifications are rather lacking. Now, that's point one. Point number two, if we have those data specifications, uh, they would be virtually useless if we don't have a method to operationalize them. If we don't have a method that allows us to formally represent those concepts and how we think the Roman economy functions and then how it gives rise to those data patterns. Now, and that is because uh, I have the impression that uh, the development of very interesting descriptive models in uh, the study of the Roman economy did not go hand in hand with the development of methods that allow us to formally represent and test aspects of those models. And then thirdly, even if we have those kind of methods, um, they're virtually useless beyond the representation of those hypotheses, beyond the representation of our idea of how the Roman economy functioned, if we don't have large data sets that allow us to make, uh, to validate aspects of those models. And I would argue that archaeological data has uh, the largest potential for that because especially Roman ceramics, for example, are present in uh, vast quantities. They're the only data source that allows us to uh, make robust quantitative uh, validations of aspects of models about the Roman economy. Now, this is not a suggestion to, so these, these are my three take home messages. You can now uh, choose to either fall asleep, run away or stay and listen and ask me very, very interesting critical questions at the end. I'm not just going to make those statements, I'm going to try to illustrate to you guys uh, why I think this is the case, um, how I think we can overcome these problems. I will suggest uh, that computational modeling is the way to go, that there are in fact very well, um, well developed methods out there that allow us to do exactly these kind of things and I'll try to show a case study in which archaeological data sets can be used on a very large geographical scale to try to validate aspects of very complex descriptive models that are so popular in the study of the Roman economy. So, again, when I read that literature, all of these descriptive models, I like to represent them as these kind of uh, blobs of different colors, different flavors of the functioning of the Roman economy, if you will. The way in which they are debated make it seem that they are very separate entities that don't actually uh, compare very favorably, that are completely uh, different to each other. Whilst Undoubtedly, all of these authors that come up with these models would um, argue that it, reality is more something like this. There are similarities between these models and there are uh, differences between these models, but they seem so distinct because we do not have the methods or maybe the, the research tradition to try to understand how exactly, uh, uh, how exactly they compare what the similarities are, what the differences are, how we can identify those in the archaeological record and in other sources. So we want to zoom in on those overlaps of those very bright colors and uh, try to identify and explore those areas more to zoom in on the center of where all of these uh, models, uh, how all of these models compare. Um, and I will give an example of that, starting with a problem. This is an archaeological case study and the problem I'll be focusing on for the next half an hour is what causes the significant differences in the wideness of tableware distributions in the Roman East? Now, tableware, um, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with that, but it's basically a type of ceramics 
Uh, the kind of tableware I'll be talking about is sometimes called fineware or terra sigillata. It is uh, pottery, uh, in this case made in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, in the period 150 BC to 150 AD, more or less. Um, and I'm talking about four different wares, four different types of tableware that were produced in four different areas. Um, so, uh, talking about Eastern Sigillata A, which is abbreviated as ESA, and is represented on this distribution map, which represents uh, assemblages of sites as the orange areas of the pie charts. Now, Eastern Sigillata um, B is represented as the green parts of the pie chart, Eastern Sigillata C as the yellow parts, and Eastern Sigillata D as the blue parts. Now, what I'm interested in is if you combine all of this information, uh, this is, by the way, uh, all of the information combined in the Icrates database of tablewares in the Roman East. Um, if we combine all of that tableware and we plot it on a map, we notice that there's a strong difference between the distribution of some wares as compared to others, the geographical distribution of these wares. Some wares, actually only one ware, like Eastern Sigillata A, is present on almost all sites and throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, whilst all three other wares, they're not just restricted to one site, they're not purely of local importance, but they're more of regional importance. They're present in the assemblages of two, three, four, five, ten, thirty sites, but not all of them. Uh, there should be 220 dots on here, by the way, uh, if, if they can all be plotted. Now, this is an interesting pattern, and it's quite a robust pattern that we can explore through time. So we noticed that for more than 100 years, at least, Eastern Sigillata A was distributed much more widely than the other wares. Um, and I like to represent it like this. Now, this looks a little bit complex, so I'm going to take my time to explain it, because it's quite an important graph. This is basically an alternative representation of the distribution map you saw earlier. Here we have all of these tablewares and how they're distributed, and we chop that database up into 25-year time slices. So every shirt that is typologically dated, or, or true excavation, dated uh, to one of these 25-year time slices is included in these different um, box plots here. Now every box represents a 25-year time slice, and I represent the number of sites on which each ware is present as uh, a point, a data point on a box. So we read the first box on the left-hand side there as ESA is found within this period on just over 90 sites, whilst ESD is found on just over 20 sites, ESC on just under 20 sites, and ESB on just under 10 sites. Okay? Now, one thing you can already see is that ESA is present on way more sites than all of the other wares, and that it is so for more than 100 years, and at least until here, and possibly until 100 AD, uh, and that then it changes uh, quite significantly. I must also add that this is a, a selection of uh, a data set that I made in which the four wares were all circulating in the Roman East, because I found that most comparable. Uh, because I'm interested in the differences between the, distribu the, where the, the distributions of these wares, so I only focus on the period in which all four of them circulated, which is this period. Okay, so now we've got those boxes, we understand that. Now there's also a lot of dashed lines on here, which are also quite important and is a, a way of representing uh, a type of information that's already on there, but in a different way. This represents the range, and the range is basically calculated as the maximum number of sites, uh, aware is present on minus the minimum number of sites. So in the case of the first box, it's uh, basically 90 for ESA minus 10 for ESB is a range of 80, uh, but in this case, you know, it's 83. So we see that the maximum difference between any two wares in any 25 year period is represented here on the right and by those dashed lines, right? So we see that through time, the difference that we're interested in explaining, the difference between the maximum distribution of two wares is, uh, decreases from 80 to 70 to 48 to 42 to 40 to 17. Okay? Now this is the pattern that we're interested in. This is a pattern that Roman archaeologists have also linked to processes about uh, the functioning of the Roman economy, and a lot of different hypotheses have been suggested to explain this. Um, 
hypotheses that concern uh, different ways of transporting ceramics, different production um, ways, different types of consumption, um, but also uh, hypotheses surrounding social networks and uh, the, the way in which um, agents that were important for, uh, for commerce uh, were connected to each other and actually gathered information and traded with each other. And that's the kind of hypothesis that I'm interested in now and will try to test. Um, so I spent so much time on explaining this because this is the kind of representation of the archaeological data set that I will compare with the simulated outcomes of a computational model. So try to keep this kind of information in your head, but the take-home message at the moment is there were four different wares and they had different geographical distributions and ESA was present on more sites than all the other ones, right? We're going to try to explain that. Okay, um, so a lot of different uh, hypotheses have been suggested to explain that. Um, I'm going to focus on just two of them. Um, you know, in order to do what I, what I said earlier, right, we don't just need to, like, everyone knows the Roman economy was a very complex thing, but we don't need to treat that complexity as being complex necessarily. We're going to try to simplify it. We're going to try to just zoom in on one area of this very co complex diagram here. We're just going to zoom in on here and see what we can do with this. And once we understand this better, we might be able to kind of, like, guide our research attention in a different direction to better understand these other areas, right? So that's exactly the kind of approach I'm taking now. Just taking two of these explanations out and trying to understand aspects of them and compare them with the archaeological record. All right, so that's uh, Peter Bang's uh, The Roman Bazaar and Peter Temin's The Roman Market Economy. I'll explain them rather briefly. I'm mainly interested in the aspects of their very complex and very uh, elaborately described uh, models that have to do with uh, the, the functioning of the Roman economy and specifically with uh, the social network structures that they hypothesize underlie the flow of goods and information uh, around the Roman Empire. So Peter uh, Bang argues that the Roman market system consisted of weakly integrated markets due to community structure of social networks which serve to protect commercial interests and opportunism whilst disadvantaging outsiders. So. What's important here and what I'll be focusing on is that community structure. He argues that a very specific type of structure between uh, traders was important for or guided the flow of goods and information. Traders had a tendency to combine into communities, to share commercial information within communities and to use that commercial information to disadvantage other communities. And he says that kind of community structure is important because it led to weakly integrated markets um, so what he, what he means by that, um, to put it very simply, is that uh, different markets on which different traders uh, traded and collected information uh, were weakly integrated if uh, information about prices, about supply and demand, about goods, was not available between the markets, or they were not integrated in that case. So if, if a limited uh, amount of information, commercial information, was available between markets, then they're weakly in integrated. Now. Um, there's other aspects of his uh, model that are also very interesting, but that I will not discuss. Most importantly, the uh, tributary empire and agrarian society. So I've got to be very clear here. I'm focusing on something very specific, a specific aspect of this model that I think shows potential for formalization in terms of concepts that can then be compared of, to aspects of another model, and together they can be compared with the archaeological record, right? And I will argue that's a useful thing to do. Um, now, not everyone agrees with Peter Bang. Uh, a lot of people critique his model, in fact, and the most, uh, the most interesting one to read is Morris Silvers. It's a very, very, um, very elaborate, um, almost attack on uh, Peter Bang's model. Very interesting. But again, if I, when I read this, I have the impression like we're throwing, um, we're throwing different interpretations of how the same phenomenon that we're interested in uh, functioned but kind of backed up by anecdotal evidence and it, there, the arguments are not conclusive. We can't, we can't really, you know, you believe this and I believe this and we both have reasons to believe it because we have data that supports it. But the data and our arguments are not comparable, right? So let's try to find another way away from the discussion between Bang and Silver. A very, very different descriptive model to that of Peter Bang is that by uh, Peter Temin. So he argues that the Roman economy was a well-functioning integrated market where prices are determined by supply and demand. The important thing I'm going to focus on here was, is, the, is the, the concept of a well-functioning integrated market. Remember Peter Bang mentioned 
it's a weekly integrated market and that weak integration was a result of the community structure. Now here Peter Temin says like, no, well, no, the, the Roman economy was way more integrated than you uh, give it credit for. It is integrated and it follows the, the laws of supply and demand. He's arguing that uh, the traders active uh, in the Roman economy that gave rise to the distribution of goods had more access to commercial information to the amount of, uh, of, uh, of goods and the prices and the supply and demand on different markets than bank gi gives it credit for. So here we have different opinions about basically the same thing using concepts that are comparable, right? Um, I'm going to leave my explanation of these models at that, but we can discuss them in more detail if you really want to. What I now just want to kind of emphasize is that we have these comparable things. We can express them in terms of concepts that are comparable. We can come up um, using the descriptions of these authors with data specifications. What kind of um, sign archaeological signature would we expect if Bang is right? What would we expect if Peter Temin is right? And most importantly, what's in between? What's this, what's, what's this gray zone, you know? The two models seem very, very different, but what's in between? How can we model the entire uh, range of possibilities in between two extremes, okay? So we need a model that allows us to explore those distributions that archaeologists are interested in, um, to think about different processes that these could suggest, um, not only suggested by archaeologists, but also by historians and classicists. Uh, a method that allows us to express these and to formally evaluate these hypotheses. I am very much aware that this all sounds very, very positivist, but believe me, I'll add a lot of uh, um, qualitative afterthoughts at the end, but this is just, I think, the best way to, um, to, to get it across. There are techniques that allow us to do this. Archaeological data is useful for quantitatively testing some of these descriptive models, and uh, we just have to give a quite extreme example to make that clear. Now, the technique I'll be using, as I said earlier, is computational modeling, and a specific type of computational modeling called agent-based modeling. Now, I'm not sure if any one of you have heard of agent-based modeling, uh, so I'll explain it uh, very, very briefly and very popular science-y quickly. Um, so basically, the idea is that in an agent-based model, we simulate little individual software agents little boy and, and boys and girls running around in a software landscape. But they're not just running around aimlessly, they're running around guided by very simple rules. For example, you, if, if I'm a software agent, I could say like, uh, Tom, move forward three steps, one, two, three. Okay, that's a very simple rule and very useless rule as well. But um, these software individuals, they can be programmed with very simple rules that we hypothesize people in the past behaved like, and we can see what kind of outcomes that gives. If we have 1,000 uh, Roman traders that are guided by simple rules of supply and demand located on different markets, what kind of output do we get? Does this kind of approach allow us to test the hypotheses of Bang and Temin? I think it does. So just to give an example, um, in, in this case study, the software individuals are the traders and they sell pots, and the traders are connected uh, within communities and the community structure will structure the flow of information and the flow of goods. The output um, will here be the distribution of pots, and we can compare that with the archaeological record. Um, a couple of important things in agent-based modeling is, I mean, a couple of popular science-y things that are often mentioned is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's, that's quite a popular thing to say, and it's quite you know, intuitive if you think about an agent-based model as something where you have uh, individuals running around being guided by very simple rules, but collectively giving rise to slightly more complex behavior that can not just be understood by looking at the rules of the individuals or the properties of the individuals. That's what they mean by that. But we're not just interested in cases where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Sometimes, you know, these hypotheses might be relative, uh, relatively straightforward representations of just the rules of individuals, but uh, amplified by however many individuals you have. And uh, a guiding rule by, uh, of, of agent-based modeling is uh, keep it simple, stupid. So if we believe that when we throw 1,000 software agents into a virtual landscape and they can give rise to very complex behavior that we can't understand by just looking at the rules, then it's probably a good idea to keep those rules as simple as we possibly can keep them. Because otherwise, we're not going to understand which rule 
gives rise to the complexity that we're interested in. If we want to tease out which patterns compare favorably with the archaeological record, and again, how that compares with the hypotheses of Bang and Temin, we need to understand exactly what rules of the software agents gives rise to that pattern, right? So we're going to keep it very simple. Uh, important to keep it simple is that from the start, when you're doing this kind of agent-based models, you need to be very clear about um, what kind of phenomenon you're studying. In this case, it's the, the Roman economy, but that needs to be slightly better uh, defined. Uh, the, the hypotheses of Bang versus that of Temin, and more specifically, the social network structure that both are, uh, authors argue uh, to give rise to the distribution of goods as, uh, as an effect of uh, the flow of information throughout that social network. Um, so what ki kind of concepts do we use to abstract that complex past phenomenon? How do we represent it as data? How do we come up with different variables that allow us to uh, implement the differences between what Bang says and what Temin says? And what kind of data patterns do we then expect as the outcome? Is that effectively what we do get and what, what causes those differences? Okay, that's just a quick introduction to agent-based modeling. Now, uh, we created an agent-based model to uh, do exactly that, to compare this aspect of uh, the social network structure in Bang and Temin's hypotheses. Key concepts in this agent-based model are traders. The traders are the individual software agents that will be guided by very simple rules. Those traders are distributed among markets. So we have a number of markets in a virtual environment and we drop traders on those markets. We can um, have scenarios where we drop a lot of traders on one market and very few on the other 99 markets or we can have scenarios where we distribute the tra traders equally, let's say 10 traders on every market for example. What are the results in terms of the distribution of products? How do we see differences there? Um, and we have products. Every trader will be able to obtain pots and sell them to other traders who can buy them, can decide to either buy a pot or not buy a pot, uh, governed by the laws of supply and demand. There will be a social network. The traders are connected to each other uh, in this community structure that is hypothesized by Bang and through that social network, they will be able to share commercial information. They will be able, if they want to, tell their co social contacts in the social network how much pods they have, um, uh, how, much, how many pods they want, how many pods they think they can sell to the people on their market, and what they think the price might be as a result of that supply and demand. Uh, and that is the supply and demand I'm talking about is commercial information in this, uh, in this model. So that social network will represent a community structuring where we'll have, in the case of Peter Bang, we will have um, a stronger degree of clustering. We'll have these kind of communities within a market, right, that prefer to share information with each other and prefer not to share information with other communities on the same market or communities on different markets. So that kind of social network structure is my implementation of the weak integration because uh, basically, you need to go through a lot of traders in order to get uh, um, accurate commercial information from many other markets uh, in the system. Um, then we can uh, increase the integration and I'll show you how I implement that in a bit. So the kind of uh, variables I'm interested in testing, um, these are basically uh, my, my representations of uh, the important aspects of uh, Peter Bang and Peter Temin's model. Um, the proportion of commercial information, accurate commercial information that is available to the agent, if I change that, what kind of result does that, um, wh in what kind of pattern does that, does that result in terms of the distribution of uh, tableware? Uh, if I change the degree of market integration by adding uh, the ability to share commercial information between markets directly, uh, what about the distribution of traders at uh, production centers? As I said, we're talking about the distribution of four different wares. These four different wares were produced in different uh, areas. Um, what if, you know, one of them was located in Antioch and the other one was located in some kind of, you know, backwater along the Mediterranean where never uh, a ship ever stops, uh, where in one case we have a very thriving big market with a hundred uh, traders trying to sell this stuff and a very, very large uh, consumption uh, hub, basically. 
And in the other, we don't have that. We have very few traders who are attracted by that place and very few consumers locally. What kind of results does that uh, uh, give rise to? And then we'll play around with uh, the maximum demand as well. And I will, I will not talk uh, about hypotheses concerning transport in this particular talk because that's a whole other topic with a lot of literature, actually. Now, um, I think you've noticed by now that the network structure, the hypothesized social network structure, is quite key in testing these hypotheses. So I will explain in detail how I create a social network structure that I think represents these two different scenarios. So when I start the agent-based model, and I will show you in a bit live how that's done, you basically click the start button, it's super easy, but it took me two years to make it, so it's quite difficult actually. But uh, if you click the start button, you will create a social network structure that you want. Right? In my case, it might represent Banks hypothesis or it might represent the social network structure hypothesized by Temin. And this is how they are created. So in five different steps. In the first step, I, um, basically represent uh, the traders as individual software agents. They're these uh, little stick figures. They're distributed among uh, markets. The markets are these bigger nodes here, these bigger balls. So this is a market with three traders. So in the first step, I uh, connect one pair of traders on two neighboring sites, uh, two neighboring markets, um, to enforce that at least every pair of uh, markets in uh, a circular layout are connected by at least one link. I will show you in practice what that means, but it basically allows me for uh, stuff that is produced in one side of the network to be at least theoretically uh, transported to every other market and to every other trader, right? I need to be able to enforce that, otherwise uh, some parts of the system can never get certain goods. So in the second step, I'm adding these, uh, I'm adding new links, oh sorry, I need to explain that uh, in every image, the, uh, the existing uh, links are given as dashed lines and the full lines represent the new links created in that step. So here in the second step, we see that one new line is created. In this step, I add uh, a number of uh, links between pairs of traders that are located on different markets. If I don't add any of these in, um, in this step, then basically we have very weakly integrated markets because the uh, proportion of traders that can share commercial information directly between different markets is very, very limited, right? But if we add a lot of them, then the market is very highly integrated because we have a higher ability to share commercial information directly between markets. So the third step, um, I create links uh, randomly between pairs of, uh, well, I create a link between randomly selected uh, pairs within the same market. So here I create a link between these two persons and here between these two. And these, are, these pairs are randomly selected. Now, this only makes sense if I do the next step, because at this point we don't have clustering yet. But if then we look at uh, the network we have and we connect uh, a proportion of the pairs of traders that have a mutual neighbor. So we basically look at what was already here and we see that this pair of traders has a mutual neighbor then we will create a link between them. If you do that a couple of times, then you get a social network structure called a small world network within the different markets. And a small world network has very specific properties. It has a high degree of clustering within, uh, within this market, but still a very low average shortest path length. That basically means that we have this kind of community structure that we're interested in. We have traders that are uh, connected to each other a lot, but very little connected to other uh, clusters on the same market, right? Um, now, the last step, um, here in this previous network, you can see that this trader on the bottom left there is still unconnected to the entire network, which basically means that this trader can never get any tableware produced anywhere in this system. In order to avoid that from happening, I add the minimum number of links necessary to connect all of the traders within the network so that it consists of one single component. Okay, that might have been a bit technical, but I think it's quite important to explain that in detail. But what these five steps give rise to, depending on how I set the variables, is either a system where I have a representation of a social network between traders that is weakly integrated, as far as my conceptualization of that goes, and strongly integrated. On the left-hand side, we have an example of 
a network where we have a high degree of clustering on the sites, very few links between clusters, and a minimal, minimal number of links between the markets to allow for products, uh, tableware that is produced anywhere to go to any other trader. But on the right hand side, we have an example where I added a number of uh, links between traders on different sites, representing a higher degree of market integration. So as I said, um, once we set up that network, uh, we will allow the traders to trade and share, share commercial information first and then trade to each other. The last technical thing I want to explain to you guys is exactly how they trade because I've actually never had the chance to explain that uh, within a presentation and now I've got the time so I kind of want to. I think I have the time. I think I have the time, yeah. So basically, in this model, once we have a social network, we are going to simulate the distribution of pottery on that network. Um, we assume that uh, a seller has an object, that a number of sellers has uh, one pot of whatever uh, of the four products and in every step of the simulation every single uh, pot of every type of tableware is considered to be sold. So we ask um, the owner of one uh, pot, we ask the seller um, and this is some pseudocode that I will go through um, line by line with you. So we basically ask the seller, someone who owns a pot, to consider selling it, right? Uh, if the seller is um, uh, connected to uh, no buyer, so basically if there's no one in his social network that he can trade with that actually wants to buy the pot, then he puts it in stock. So rather than throwing it away and never selling it again, he considers selling it at a later time step. Uh, but if there are people that he can actually trade the pot with, uh, then he will uh, either stock the product if he doesn't get uh, a profit or, or, or a break even, because if he can't make a profit, why would he actually sell the pot? He's not going to make a loss, right? Or, uh, if he can make a profit, uh, then the pot changes hands from the seller to the buyer. And the buyer can then decide to either stock the product and sell it again in the next turn, so basically allowing for redistribution. Because he, he might think like, oh, this is a product, I don't have a lot of this product, and uh, there's a lot of people here in my, on my market that want this product. So rather than uh, you know, selling it on to a consumer straight away, I'll keep it and I'll redistribute it because I will get more profit from it because the local demand is much higher than the demand uh, uh, where the, the seller is based. Okay, so we'll stock the product or he will uh, sell it uh, to a local consumer and deposit the product. So basically this is a relatively simple procedure, completely deterministic of how a seller who, who has a pot gives it or sells it to a uh, uh, a buyer who then deposits it basically at a market. What that gives rise to is distributions of tableware. Distributions of tableware on different markets that we can then compare with the archaeological record. I hope you've noticed that this is completely unrealistic, right? And extremely simplifying. I mean, one thing that's not in here is that uh, sometimes we all know that sellers really want to sell stuff even if they won't make a profit, right? Uh, and that's even, uh, th that's even part of the laws of supply and demand as well. There are a lot of these simplifications like that in here because, because of this maxim of uh, keep it simple stupid, right? I wanted to keep the rules as simple as possible and make a simple first model, see what that gives rise to, rather extreme model, and then add complexity once I understand this very simple model, okay? So keep it simple stupid and we can proceed. So these are results. Before I show the results, I want to show you the model itself. Um, so this is the scary bit. Ooh. Basically, I've implemented it in a, in a software called NetLogo. It's really easy to use. It's, like the, e it's the kind of um, programming language that they use to teach uh, seven-year-olds how to program. And uh, I mastered it at the age of 27. I'm not <laughs> too proud of it. But uh, it's really easy to use and uh, it's freely available as well, so I can only advertise it. But basically, this is an example of, um, of a kind of a relatively simple uh, model. Um, it's a visual representation here. We have a lot of knobs and dials and basically variables on the left-hand side here and a couple of buttons. And those sliders uh, allow me to change the variables that I mentioned earlier are very important for, in my implementation, expressing uh, one extreme hypothesis and another, and the entire gray zone in between, 
All right? So I'm just going to give you uh, uh, an example of how this works. Uh, we have, in this case, 200 traders and 20 sites. Um, I will distribute the uh, traders unequally among the sites following an exponential distribution. And um, the maximum number of connections that each trader can have is five. Now, this doesn't, probably doesn't mean much to you, but when I press the button, setup, it's actually going to create a kind of hypothesized social network structure that represents these variables here that I think give, uh, represent one of the hypotheses. These are network properties of that uh, particular network. And you will notice that as you change the variables uh, to the left or to the right, these kind of network measures uh, change. And these network measures give you an indication of exactly what properties of the network might give rise to information and goods being spread faster or slower to different parts of the network. Now, to just give you um, uh, an example, these points here represent the markets now. They are uh, located along a circular layout and on those different markets are uh, the traders. I'm going to uh, give you an example of a, of a rather extreme scenario where we have very few links between, no, even less than that. So in this scenario, we would have very few links between traders on different markets. And we see, as I said earlier, I enforce this kind of circle here between pairs of traders on neighboring sites just to enable for a minimum of connectivity for, to allow the, the flow of goods throughout this entire system. Um, you can see the traders here. I made them a little bit bigger. And um, if I lay this out using the network structure, you can see this kind of community structure that I was talking about earlier. So, you know, I'm just kind of moving them around a little bit to show you the structure of the network a little bit better. Um, and you can see as they move away that we have little clusters of uh, traders. These are the communities I'm talking about. And the clusters are uh, connected to each other with just a few links. And they are connected with clusters on other markets with even fewer links, right? So this is an example of um, how one of these hypotheses is represented. Now, if we click the go button, these traders basically trade with each other and the, the pottery just flows all through the, the network. Here, uh, on this plot here, we can see uh, which one of the products is distributed most widely. In this case, uh, product B is only distributed to five sites and uh, the other ones to two sites. I don't do this for just you know, 500 time steps. We do this for like um, 20,000 time steps in this case. And because there's a lot of randomness in this model, we do it multiple times. In this case, 100 times, because that's how much my computer can handle, right? Um, uh, and then those kind of results are used to compare with the archaeological record. I hope that clarified the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Now, what kind of results does this give rise to? So this is a time to bring back to mind that very complicated plot I showed of the archaeological distributions. Because these are results of different experiments of this model that can be compared with the archaeological distributions. I'm going to again explain them uh, in, in a little bit of detail because this is important. This is a box plot. And every box represents a different experiment. A different experiment with different variable settings. Um, now, every box uh, shows the range um, out of 100 simulations. So uh, here, to read this box plot, for example, this one here, the bottom star, is the lowest out of 100 simulation, uh, the lowest range. And remember, the range was the maximum distribution of one wear in a simulation, minus the minimum distribution of a wear in a simulation. Uh, so this is the maximum uh, 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 range, and the top one there is, uh, sorry, this is the minimum, and that is the maximum there. And then we have an average. So we see that there's actually quite a difference uh, between the results of a simulation, but it's still more or less normally distributed, and we can look at the average there and compare that with the archaeological record. Um, the ranges that I showed you earlier for the archaeological record are, again, those dashed lines with the periods, the 25-year periods on the right-hand side there. Uh, so what we see is that there's a big difference between these results and the different experiments. We see that experiments where we have 
no market integration except for the bare minimum, don't give rise to very big ranges. Nowhere near the kind of ranges that we see in archaeology. So this, that's what's represented here. If we add weak integration to these markets, if we add more links between the markets, we will see, not very surprisingly, that that range increases, that the difference between the maximum and the minimum distribution of uh, pottery increases. <coughs> but the difference is not that big and nowhere close to the archaeological record. Now, um, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, different scenarios. One in which we ha distribute the traders on the production side. So I, I, I told you we have four products that, produce, that are produced in four different production centers. What if we put a different number of traders on each of those production centers? That is represented by these last four box plots here. Whilst on this one we have an equal uh, number of traders on uh, each production site. Now this shows that um, the unequal distribution of traders on production sites compares more favorably with what we see in the archaeological record for the period 50 to 100 AD whilst the equal um, distribution of traders on production sites compares more favorably to these blue dashed lines here, which is basically the period 100 to 150 uh, AD. And then we see between those last four ones, which are basically you know, examples of scenarios where we have very strong market integration, so commercial information can flow rather directly between different markets. Um, we see uh, differences depending on uh, whether the traders themselves can supply for a very low demand or for a very high demand. And I want to look into one of those results in a little bit more detail before I interpret them. So it's a bit unfortunate that the logo is overlapping there, but here I'm, I'm uh, representing two different experiments. On the left hand side we have four box plots belonging to experiment number one. On the right hand side we have four box plots belonging to experiment number two. And these box plots to the far right here are the same boxes that you've already seen for the distribution uh, that we observed in the archaeological record between 25 BC and 100 AD, uh, the period in which the, the differences in the range is highest. Now we see that if we have a scenario where we have a very uh, low maximum demand, where traders can, um, where, where traders can uh, obtain, uh, well, are, can, can supply for a very low uh, number of consumers on each site, uh, we see differences as compared to the experiment where the traders can supply for a lot of them. But what we, what we see is that the range is basically the same. You can see that the difference between this blue line and this blue line is almost the same as the difference between this red line and this red line, and that represents the range. But I've, I've um, kind of exploded this pattern into the different wares. So here for each experiment we see a box for uh, the distribution of each different ware. So where one is distributed to most sites, where two to less, and where four to the lowest number of sites. So we see that even though the range that I showed you earlier for those two experiments was actually very similar and seems to suggest that you know, they're, um, they're interesting to understand the distributions between 50 and 100 AD. So the red lines, that's what I'm talking about here. Actually, if we look at them in a bit more detail, they show us very different things. So experiment number one compares more favorably indeed with those 50 to 100 AD um, uh, distributions, whilst experiment number two doesn't really compare favorably with, with any of them, but it does seem to give rise to a wider distribution. Now, I'm not going to talk about any more results in any detail. I'm just going to give you my interpretation of a couple of very general patterns. So overall, um, and please notice the tone here, because I'm being very careful now. Overall, uh, I've proven nothing, but I've disproven maybe a couple of things, which I find quite interesting, actually. I've, I think it's uh, less likely that weak mar market integration explains differences in tableware distribution. So weak market integration might not explain these differences. Um, so I've seen scenarios where we have weak market integration did not give rise to the very big differences that we saw in the archaeological record. Uh, so this suggests to me that maybe future research should go in the direction of the kind of processes, the kind of maybe individual uh, types of traders that do give rise to uh, market integration or the kinds of uh, traders that have the financial freedom to allow for commercial, to, to, to gather commercial information that is reliable between different markets and are able to act upon that knowledge. Uh, another interpretation. So equal production does not explain differences in tableware distribution. 
So if we have experiments where in the four production sites we have equal numbers of traders, then we don't get results that compare favorably with the archaeological record. Suggesting that maybe we should uh, think about um, the, the production side of things a little bit more. In which uh, kind of cases do we have archaeologically or literary sources that suggest that there are very big differences between the, the productivity of these different production centers and why is that the case? One explanation that's quite popular in the archaeological li literature is that um, some of these tableware production centers were associated with very active urban hubs. You know, they were usually um, um, uh, located in the countryside but in the hinterland of a very big uh, basically consumption center that provides for you know this first kind of impetus that is needed to produce a lot right so maybe we should focus future research in the in that direction um, another interpretation equal demand does not explain differences in tableware distribution so as I showed uh, in scenarios where there is no difference between the demand on different markets uh, we don't get very wide uh, differences in the distribution of tableware um, and this to me suggests that maybe there is something like the gravitational pull of large centers. So not just the importance of the, 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 the large consumption of sites located close to the production center itself, but maybe this indicates the importance of very large consumption centers that are, you know, that just are key to the redistribution of these kind of products throughout the Mediterranean. So not just close to the production center, but you know, sites uh, where there's no production of this stuff whatsoever. Uh, like uh, Alexandria, for example. Antioch might be related to the production of ESA, but Alexandria is not. Maybe we should focus direction, uh, research in that direction. Okay, so some overall conclusions of this interpretation. This model is clearly simplifying. It is stupid, it is wrong. But it's purposefully stupid and wrong in a sense that it is useful. I try to simplify these very complex descriptive hypotheses and I try to focus on those aspects of them that I could represent using uh, easily definable and comparable concepts. Now doing that allowed me to select a couple of variables, allowed me to compare them. So it is wrong, yes, the Roman economy was more complex than I represented it here, but it is useful because I've indicated that maybe some scenarios could be disproven, or at the very least, I think we should direct our attention in a different direction. Um, I've shown that you can use comparable uh, concepts that are representable as data, as very generic simulated data, but some of that could be compared to very, very large scale uh, patterns, just very coarse patterns in the archaeological record. Um, so it allows for comparison with archaeological data. Now, I focused on one of these overlaps of these diagrams here. Uh, the Roman economy was much more complex, so uh, I just hope that I've indicated uh, the kind of potential that this approach has. So I'll just repeat my take-home message for those who have been sleeping for 30 minutes but thought it was worth to stay in anyways. Um, the Roman economy, the study of the Roman economy has hit a wall as far as I'm concerned. We need more computational modeling because we need to be able to express our interesting models in terms of concepts that are definable and comparable. We need to come up with uh, the kind of ex data expectations uh, that we expect as the outcome of those particular concepts and processes that we hypothesize. We need to use methods that allow us to compare these things formally where possible and again where possible if we have large archaeological data sets that allow us to val validate even the tiniest aspects of these, they do push our research agenda for forward. They might allow us to focus the study of the Roman economy in more fruitful directions, rather than just having two opposing uh, uh, paradigmatic camps that don't even talk to each other anymore because they disagree about everything, right? Um, I have a lot of people to thank, but mainly you guys for staying so long, so thank you guys. Thank you.